Hi there. Welcome back to season four of It Happened in Hollywood. I'm your host, Seth Abramovich, senior writer at The Hollywood Reporter. For our season premiere, we have one of the most legendary, visionary directors of all time. I'm very excited about this one, and I think you will be too. And that's what's up today on the first episode of the fourth season of It Happened in Hollywood. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to bring you another season of my podcast. We've really rounded up some of my heroes, and the conversations have been so fascinating. I'm really excited to start rolling these out for you guys. And what better than Terry Gilliam? What a genius, just a visual genius, a creative mind that really has no limits. His work is really about the unlimited scope of imagination, but where we may daydream, he turns these daydreams into pictures, movies, and uh, he does them unlike any other. He grew up in Minnesota and then moved to LA and started becoming a cartoonist. And uh, he'll tell the story himself, but that's how he eventually found his way to London in the realm of a group of young comedians who became Monty Python. And uh, if you love the visual uh, language of Monty Python. That's all him, all those animations that would link together the sketches on their TV series. And then he, of course, went on to co-direct their first film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And then he went off on his own journey. And that's what we're going to talk about today. He had done two films, The Jabberwocky, and then he did one that really affected me as a kid called Time Bandits, which was a pretty freaky movie, but uh, very enjoyable. And then, of course, in 1985, he took sort of a step into a more ambitious direction with Brazil, which was kind of Kafka-esque, kind of Orwellian, but entirely something new and something I would call Gilliamian. (laughs) So let's get right to it, because he is a wonderful, wonderful interview. Here we go. Terry Gilliam and Brazil. Terry Gilliam, thank you so much for joining us on It Happened in Hollywood. To me, you are a legend beyond. And uh, just to have you here is such a thrill. Uh, So thank you, first of all. It's nice talking to somebody that I don't know. It's nice for a change. (laughs) Um, So where are you right now? Could you you tell our listeners where I I see a bust of what looks like uh, Alfred Hitchcock behind you? I'm not sure if that's correct, but where, where are you? No, that's uh, I'm in my the top of my house, which is my studio and my my everything. Uh, And if I look out the window out there, I can see all the way across London uh, to the North Downs. I'm probably sitting in one of the highest seats in the city. (laughs) How romantic. uh, How incredible. So so that's it it functions as your studio, this uh, attic or uh, do you do you create a lot of your ideas up there? Yeah, I mean, this is where I re- really am. I escaped from my family years ago up here. They live below me. <laughs> and and I have just this area that I love. It's like I pull the ceiling out, and it's so it's a peak roof now. It's like inside um, um, a tithe barn is what it feels like. Incredible. And so you have lived in London for how long, or England for how long now? Most of your life, I think, right? Indeed. I came here in 1967. And so I would love to start, if you don't mind, uh, with a little bit of background on on how you uh, arrived there. I know you you were born in uh, Minneapolis, a city I finally got to visit this year after the first time and was very charmed. And then you ended up in L.A. uh, and you uh, went to college here. So could you tell us a bit about your youth and how it, it drew you eventually to London? Uh, Well, the best part of my youth was when we lived in Minnesota because we lived in the country. I'm a country boy. (laughs) I was referred, the first time I came to England, I was referred to by somebody who didn't like me as a monosyllabic Minnesota farm boy. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I loved it. I lived in the country, so I grew up in the country. Um, When I was 12, my parents moved the whole family out to Los Angeles, which was uh, exciting times that... um, and that's where I went to school and eventually college. But when I finished college, I went off to New York 
because I had no plans for myself. I had graduated as a political science major, but I'd been spending much of my time in college drawing cartoons and sending the college humor magazine called Fang off to Harvey Kurtzman, the man who created Mad Comics, my wow. hero. And we just, we just lost uh, Al Jaffe yesterday at 102 years. I woke up this morning to see there's Al, his face all cherubby and outrageously funny human being is no longer with us. And what happened is on the Hebrew magazine that I was editing in college, sending it to Harvey, he wrote some very nice letters back to me saying, you're doing some good work. And when I graduated, I said, I'm coming to New York. And he said, what? There's no work in New York. You're a fool. And of course, being a fool, I went to New York. And what did I do? I met Harvey in the Algonquin Hotel, which to me was the legendary place of the round table where sure. Dorothy and all the great wits of the time gathered. And I knocked on the door to the apartment, walked in, and there I was in heaven, basically. I was with the pantheon of the gods, all the great cartoonists. Al Jaffe was there, Willie Wood, um, Jack Davis, Arnold Roth, Bill Elder. They were all working on the new Annie Fanny, which was going to be Harvey's greatest well, he thought, uh, achievement, this full-color, beautifully rendered cartoon about a sexy girl. Uh, an animated, like a... This was, these were just, you know, a proper comic strip, oh. Playboy magazine. <laughs> <laughs> was this, this was pre-Felix uh, the Cat before all that, and the X-rated, uh, not Felix, sorry, uh, Fritz the Cat, the X-rated... Um, animated but that was a thing right kind of this is before bob uh <laughs> entered our lives uh, a robert crumb uh, uh, right and so i what happened i walked in there were all these god gods to me and the assistant editor of help magazine which harvey was editing at that point had was leaving that day and I filled the void that was left. And so I'm working with my great hero, surrounded by all these incredible talents, being an assistant editor on a magazine that went across America and gathered together really all the great car young cartoonists at that time, uh, Gilbert Shelton, uh, uh, Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, and Robert Crumb, most of all. And um, that was the beginning of relationships with all these incredibly talented people. Was Mad Magazine out at this time, or did that come after? Yeah, no, Mad was first. Mad was Harvey's creation. Uh, with um, William Gaines was the publisher. Harvey cr created that magazine, brought together all these incredibly talented people. It was a huge success. He then got in a fight with the publisher, Will Gaines, uh, because he felt he... Uh, he was the creator of it all and should be respected as such. And they parted their ways. And then Harvey developed other magazines. There was one called Trump. There was one called Humbug. And eventually he settled on Help magazine, which continued for several years um, before and after my time there. <laughs> and so and then was that what brought you to England eventually? Did Help uh, sort of become a a British magazine, or what, what was the transatlantic pull? Well, what it really was, living in New York at that time, um, there was radio shows playing the goons, um, records of the goons. Nobody saw them, but there they were. So I'd become a huge uh, Anglophile when it came to humor. Um, and the magazine collapsed around me and Harvey, and I had saved a little bit of money, and I went hitchhiking around Europe for five months and fell in love with Europe. I just felt, this is where civilization really is, not America, as far as I was concerned. The, the Vietnam War was on, all sorts of changes were happening in America. So I fell in love with Europe, came back to America, lived in Harvey's attic for several months because I had no other income, then moved out to Los Angeles, got a job in advertising. I was a um, um, both an art director and uh, a writer. And that lasted for 11 months. And in the course of that time, I met an English girl that I 
fell madly in love with. She wanted to return to England. I wanted to leave America. And so it was to England we went. Amazing. And how how fortuitous for the world that you did do that, because, of course, you then came into uh, the the realm of a, a collection of young comedians who would go on to make something called Monty Python. Maybe you've heard of it. So uh, how, how did that begin? Because I think they started in children's television, didn't they? Well, it's there were basically two groups. There was uh, Mike Palin, Terry Jones, and Eric Heidel, who were doing um, Do Not Adjust Your Set, this children's show. Uh, and John Cleese and Graham Chapman were writing together. They were writing for the Frost Report. John had become quite famous on television, again, on the Frost Report, where he played an upper-class guy. It was called, <laughs> it was, I was working class, I was middle class, and I'm upper class. So it was the class system, and John was there. I had actually got John into Help Magazine before I left America, because we did these fumetti, which are basically comics, only it's photographs, it's not drawn. And it was, in a sense, working like in the movie industry, you had to have sets, props, costumes, and actors. No, it wasn't moving. It was all still photographs. And I got John to appear in one because he was over in New York on the coattails of um, Beyond the Fringe, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, and sure. all, and with the Cambridge Circus, which Graham Chapman was involved in as well. It was Cambridge University Humor Group. And John, as always, stands out from most crowds. And I got him to be in this this fumetti. It's a, it's a tale about a man who falls in love and has apparently some kind of relationship, sexually possibly, with his daughter's Barbie doll. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's not the plot of the Barbie movie. <laughs> exactly. And when I went off to Europe, hitchhiking around, he moved to Chicago and worked in magazines. And then we basically reunited when I ended up back in England. Incredible. And so then they came together, I guess they merged their two groups to make Monty Python. And and so you became uh, their animator for their TV show, right? You weren't you weren't uh, acting with them at the, at first. You were creating the sort of visual language of Monty Python. Well, basically, I had done my first bit of animation for Do Not Judge Your Set for the, the children's show. And and Terry Jones in particular liked the um, the free-form nature of it. It was almost stream of consciousness. And he thought, that's the way we should do Python. Take the, 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 the punchlines out. Go from one thing to another. And so that began that kind of rhythm. And then I was not performing, I was doing the animation. And I began turning up on screen when uh, after a few year, uh, weeks of delivering my animations and then the show would be recorded, I'd be sitting around twiddling my fingers. I was just bored, I wanted to do something. So I'd put on all the costumes nobody else wanted to wear and go out and be, <laughs> make a fool of myself. <laughs> um, and then the, the style of that animation with the sort of Victorian uh, like uh, antique things that you would animate and, and very surreal and suddenly a, uh, some kind of dragon would come and eat the the you know where did that come from that was you made it up uh, uh, on the fly as you were creating this language or is it something that you've always sort of gravitated to that look which is so specifically yours it was necessity is what created that style because i only had a couple of weeks to produce like three or four minutes of animation per show. And the only way one could do it is cutting out other people's artwork, basically. So <laughs> I was always cutting out the artwork of dead artists because they don't come and sue you. So Smart. <laughs> that's how it started. And because I wasn't sitting and doing all the elaborate cell-by-cell -cell drawings, I could only just do it and just cut out and move the, the, the pieces of paper around in hopefully a slightly animated way. And that's how it began and, and continued. 
It's so great. I mean, it's just so funny and dark and exactly the right tone. You know, it, it's all of a piece with their comedy. So, okay. So now I, I know we're moving through this very quickly. I'm sure we could speak hours just about how you even got to Brazil. But to, Brazil is the main course today. So I'm trying to get there. So you did direct your first film uh, with, it was uh, Python's first film. It was Holy Grail. I mean, what a first outing. So could, could you just tell us a bit about that? I, I can't resist. Well, that was, again, Terry Jones and I were very twitchy about the quality of the television shows, the lighting, the cost, everything. We had wanted to, to direct. And so we basically convinced the others that anybody named Terry could direct the film. And they agreed, <laughs> foolishly. <laughs> so Terry and I went off. We learned how to direct by doing it, not by going to film school and all. And we just threw ourselves into it. And that kind of, we weren't naive because we'd watched enough movies that in, in inspired us. And I was really thinking about Pasolini and then painters like Bruegel. These are the images I had in my head. And that's how we approached the whole thing. And it, I can't believe we pulled it off as quickly and as cheaply as we did. And the film continues to make people laugh. <laughs> It is absolutely one of the funniest films of, of all time. Uh, so funny. Just that little killer rabbit. I'll, I'll never stop thinking about him. <laughs> it, what was important to me in particular, I think Terry and, and agreed with me on this, that I wanted the comedy had to be in a believable world. You had to believe the world was real, no matter how absurd that world was. And that's... I've spent a lot of effort to try to get a lot of atmosphere, a lot of sense of place within that, rather than so many comedies before that were just people going out and being funny. We wanted the comedy to come out of the mud and the sense of deprivation and starvation and everything. And, and, and that's why I think it works so well. The bring out your dead of it all. <laughs> um, the the Pasolini reference I had never thought of it till now, but yes, of course, it it, it looks so much like his his films. Okay, so uh, so obviously you have a huge hit with that, and then you make two films in succession. You'd make Jabberwocky, and then uh, you make Time Bandits, of course, which uh, frightened and delighted me in equal measure as a child. I will never forget the the uh, effect of that nightmarish film <laughs> on my young self. It's a sweet and lovely film. It's charming. It's delightful. <laughs> it's a kid's film. <laughs> and I just thought kids were tougher than most adults thought they were. So I thought <laughs> it, 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 was, it was actually when Time Bandits came out, it was uh, the parents that were worried. The kids loved it. And I, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's amazing. I, 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 I will never forget it. Let's put it that way. And uh, I was completely transported. And it's a, a child's story through your eyes, which, let's face it, is going to have uh, absurdity and monstrosity and um, darkness and, um, and a lot of humor and light and fun. Um, so now, is it correct that you, you consider uh, basically Time Bandits, Brazil and Munchausen like a, a, a trilogy? Did you set out to make a well, trilogy? I, or? I, I didn't say so. I had to say something during interviews, so I invented the idea of a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I said it actually, I said Munchausen was actually the fourth part of my trilogy. Right. <laughs> it wasn't planned that way. It just happened that way. That you know, yeah. You know, Time Bandits is about a kid and the kid's point of view of the world, and Brazil is about a man, a young man who's avoiding responsibility. And then Munchausen is about the old man who nobody believes in his fantasies anymore. Ba -bum. <laughs> such, such a beautiful trio of, of uh, films and so influential in terms of visual language of films that were to come. But uh, of the three, I would say Brazil uh, is truly your masterpiece and stands so well. I, I just watched it again and just astonished by what you accomplished, uh, knowing now that there's no computers back then. Everything had to be practically uh, achieved. And um, I, I just, my hat is off to you. I mean, what an achievement. Uh, such an amazing movie. It was, it. I don't know, it was just something that I wanted to get out of my system and finally did, but it was, the whole process was very difficult and painful. And uh, I mean, we were shooting a 20 week, 20 um, week shoot. And it was around the 12th week that I said, 
we're never going to get through this. This is going to cost us another many, many, many um, do millions of dollars more than what we had budgeted. And also, it was going to be a five-hour film if I did everything that I had written and storyboarded. <laughs> so I, I convinced Arnon Melshaw, the producer, can we just stop for two weeks and let me just pull pages out of the script? And we did. In the middle of the whole shoot, we stopped. All the crew went home. <laughs> and waited till I threw enough pages away until we started again. Was that painful? It must be, you know, you're saying goodbye to... You really you start with great expectations and, ah, oh, hubris. You can do everything. And then reality just starts setting in and, and you get so depressed in the middle of the filmmaking process, you realize you've made a huge mistake and you just want to go and kill yourself. So you just rip some arms and legs off your favorite child, the film you're making, <laughs> and see what's left. Can, this, can the creature still survive? What was strangely happening and... It was things were actually developing as we were shooting the way the sets were changing and the characters that we were achieving what I wanted to achieve, but in a simpler way than the, these huge specta, uh, spectacles that I had written for. And in fact, the dream aspect of the film, the original script, was it, it was sort of half and half. In the end, we pulled out a lot of the dream stuff and we ended up with telling the same story and achieving the same effect for less money and and a life was still left to be lived afterwards. So let's go back to the where the kernel of, of Brazil came from. Uh, you know, this is a very 1984 type story, George Orwell, and I think it came up as 1984 was approaching. Well, like, when did you first think of the ideas for it? Well, it probably was the approach of 1984, because and, and, I had never read 1984. It was just one <laughs> right. of those stories I knew in the, from the zeitgeist. Right, right. <laughs> I knew enough about it. And then I became, well, it was also a time when there was uh, a fair amount of te proper ter terrorism going on. Uh, serious stuff. There were the bottom Einhof group was in Germany. The Red Brigade were in Italy. Everything was going on, and that intrigued me. And people were, at that point, being incarcerated in Brazil and being charged for their incarceration. So then I started reading a lot about medieval uh, witchcraft and the witch finders and that whole period. And suddenly, I said, put the, if we put the two things together, <laughs> what happens? Uh, because... And then at the same time, be, being a political science uh, major, I was thinking about governments and systems and how they, what they need to survive. And if you're an organization that is out there to stop um, terrorism, what do you need? What's your fuel? Terrorists. <laughs> and whether they exist or not, you need them. And I then moved to that next stage of saying, all right, so these huge organizations costing lots of money need to maintain the fuel no matter what. So at a certain point, are there really terrorists going on? Or are they just being created, events created, created, explosions going off in unfortunate places, and you blame the terrorists for everything? And it sort of grew out of that. To make it even more complex, <laughs> I was obsessed with the Peter Principle. Does that mean anything? I mean, yes, it sounds familiar, but I think I'm mixing it up with Peter Pan syndrome. So what is Peter Principle? The Peter Principle was that in large organizations, people rise to the position <laughs> of their no incompetence. No longer good at being. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and organizations are really run by all the people that are not good at the job they're presently doing. And I that intrigued me. And then I thought, okay, now we've got a character like Sam Lowry who's avoiding going up that path. He's hiding. Down. He's not taking responsibility. That's actually, in the end, for me, the film is about Sam, who is part of a large organization that is doing certain things, and he's taking no responsibility for it. And and all these pieces started shifting. I I had actually written on uh, ninety eight pages of the story that I was trying to tell, and then Tom Stoppard came into my life, <laughs> and 
And I thought, this is great. I mean, what he can do with words, I can do with images. So let's see how this works. And so the basic script that is there is Tom's script based on these 98 pages, but he made them work on just about every level that they needed to work. Well, that's fascinating to hear because I watched um, like a documentary about the film but was made during the making of the film. And at the time, it seemed like you and Tom were not getting along or not working in the same way that you like to work, where he would disappear for long periods of time, then come back and give you his pages. And that he wasn't even sure how many of his pages ended up in the final script. So you're saying that it, that it is mostly his work. Of course, yes. It's... it's what happened is, with Tom, oh, I'm dealing with a professional, not like other pythons who were, who were just <laughs> good things. Right. But I had th three drafts of his scripts. That's what he was commissioned for, and that's what we paid for. And in the end, there were certain things that I wasn't happy with, uh, and he wasn't there to fix them. So I actually brought in Charles McEwen to help me on a few bits and pieces. He's credited as well. But it's really Tom's work. Uh, I threw out, he had this brilliant opening that was just magnificent. It started in a uh, beautiful jungle, and there's a beetle, a beautiful iridescent beetle flying around, and it settles on a leaf. It's all Edenic is what's going on at the start. And then this terrible noise is building up, and suddenly this monster machine comes grinding through the forest, ripping up all the trees, spewing them into uh, wool, um, chopping them into uh, wood pulp, and and at the same time creating the wood pulp into paper, huge rolls of newsprint, which is then shipped to, um, in fact, all this paperwork is shipped to the ministry for the beginning of all the paperwork and all that. It was beautiful. And the beetle flew along around this machinery and all the way to the ministry, and that's the bug at the baby that falls into the machine. It was beautiful. It said so many wonderful things, but we couldn't afford it. So I just had to chop it out <laughs> and and jump immediately into uh, uh, central services. <laughs> just from those few things you've said, I, it's so astonishing to me how current the, the film still feels. I mean, first of all, that sequence was well before uh, the, the sort of movement to save the Brazilian rainforest. It, that hadn't had bubbled up yet. And yet there it predicted it all. And then when you you have uh, sequences in uh, malls and fancy restaurants of uh, these horrible uh, explosions and everyone goes about continuing with their lunch. I mean, every day you turn on the news and there's these uh, horrible shootings around the United States. And within 12 hours, people have moved on to the the next thing and it becomes normality and it is not normality. And then you have these bureaucrats who do absolutely nothing and uh, well, look around and uh, you'll, you'll see that a lot now too. So there's a lot of resonance. Uh, whatever was inspiring you to create this story, uh, there's certainly, you know, it, it has resonated over the, the many years since it's come out. Uh, incredible work. A few years ago, when I was back promoting one of my other later films in, in the States, I said I was thinking of suing George W. Bush and Dick Cheney for the illegal and unauthorized remake of Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you go. And here we are in this uh, infinite loop of it. It's, it's madness. But that's what the film is. It's about the madness of, uh, of modern culture and, uh, and one man who dares to stand up against it. Is that the story of Donald Trump we're speaking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could his he could easily be one of these uh, these you know crazy leaders in this film. I mean, he's he's as uh, they are abs as absurd as he is. He's abs as absurd as they are, and you know maybe it seems closer to reality now than it ever has. So we have the script now. Uh, Let's go right to the casting. Uh, as your main character, Sam Lowry, you, you cast Jonathan Price, who's in, uh, I would say, almost every scene, right? Very demanding, physically demanding role. Christ, oh, keep moving! Get out of my cab. What? Just drive! You touch me. Nobody touches me. What is... Oh, God. Please, please, drive on! Drive on, will you? But, oh, shit! Move over, I'll don't drive. Don't touch that! Don't touch anything! <laughs> it's okay, officer. Thank you. It's okay. I've got everything under control. Thank you. Oh, shit! 
Listen, please, drive. Drive, trust me. You are in terrible danger. You're an embarrassment, please. Please drive, trust me, trust me. Drive and I'll explain everything. Please. Okay, okay, you asked for it. I'm information retrieval officer. DZ these, these stroke 105 and I'm arresting you. So drive on or I'll blast your fucking head off. So how did how did you arrive at Jonathan? Oh, uh, well, I looked at a lot of other people. I was even pressured. Uh, I, I, I went out to L.A. with my little video camera, and I was screen testing people. They, they'd come, and I'd just ask them to read this bit and that. And I can't remember. There was a guy There were on te at television at that point. There were two very successful people. One was Tom Hanks, and the other was his co comedic partner, whose name I cannot remember. This is embarrassing. And um, I was interested in Tom Hanks. I was, this is the other guy was the one that really intrigued me. And I Are you talking up, about uh, Peter Scolari? Or who was his partner? Well, it's not Peter Scolari. It's, but Peter, I think, is his first name. Uh, it's not Scolari, though. It's, uh, I don't think so. Was it on a TV show? Yeah, it was a, it was a TV show with Tom... Hanks and him, they were, they were their they show. They would dress up as women? Not that I remember. I didn't see the... <laughs> <laughs> Bosom buddies. <laughs> that, that was his first show. He dressed as a woman. <laughs> it, was, it was probably Bosom Buddies. That yeah. may have been. And I was just out. Literally, Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis came in to let me video her. Rebe Rebecca de Mornay. Right. Um, Rebecca de Mornay was... Uh, Tom Cruise's wife at the time, and I oh, they were they were in uh, risky business together. Well, that's what happened with me. I was told by my casting director, I must come and see uh, this new kid that's in this movie, <laughs> and I already uh, tested Rebecca. Um, I think, and I went to this editing room, and there was the scene, Tom's big one in his underwear, zipping out, and suddenly he's <laughs> there. This kid is a movie star. There was no question he had it. And uh, But it was a strange time because he wasn't available to be taped when I was out there. And I said, Tom, if I can't tape you, I can't consider you. And he said something to the effect of, my people don't want me to just go on to any old video. I think he was really well protected in those days because they knew they had a huge star on their hands and they didn't want some you know, sloppy tape out there, somehow, which is not what I was doing. I mean, Kathleen Turner came, I did her, I did Madonna. Madonna was, at that point, before she was a huge name, she was... She was very um, hot on the east um, east side of New York at that point. Right. And they were all good people. And then there was this girl that had really done nothing called Kim Grice. And I put her on tape. <laughs> and she's the one that got the job. Wow. Um, she's excellent, Kim Grice. And she's not a name uh, you, you see much about anymore. Um, but uh, she did have a, a period, you know, there where she was doing a lot. And uh, she has to play two very different roles in this. Uh, a tough, independent thinking woman with short hair. And, and then the, the, his, the object of his fantasies in these daydream sequences. Uh, and I almost didn't even realize at first it was the same woman because it's such a different performance. You, you probably think I'm, uh, 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 I'm bonkers, right? Mad, raving. No! No, I think you're very attractive. What? Yeah! Yeah, sit back. Let, let me have a look at you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good looking, sexy. Just my type. <laughs> I don't believe you. Why not? Well, I, I, I just don't deserve such terrific luck. Damn right. But I, I just to back up a bit, because I'm obsessed with Madonna. So how was her audition? It was very strange, because she was a really tough babe, is what she was. <laughs> she took no prisoners. And... I don't think uh, 
I didn't realize she was going to be the queen that she was. And so I treated her like a normal person. I'm not sure how well that went down. <laughs> she didn't look like the Madonna we now know. She was a short... <laughs> Neither does Madonna. <laughs> she's she was Italian when I met her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just picturing uh, Brazil starring Tom Cruise and Madonna, and like my mind is melting right now. But okay. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. So, so then you ended up going to... Uh, I mean, obviously, Jonathan Price is such a brilliant actor. I mean, uh, maybe, you know, it was for the best. I can't imagine anyone else playing playing this. But you had to age it up the character, I assume to to use him no i it was just the opposite we uh i had i think uh there were a couple others all much they were all younger than john jonathan uh and he had um i had i'd known him for a bit of time and i just knew he was the most incredible actor and funny he had everything going for him and so i said okay i'm gonna do a screen test with him and to convince Arnon Milshon, my producer, that this was the guy. Now, Arnon had been thinking Tom Cruise, thinking everybody else, Rupert Everett, all these beautiful younger boys. And Jonathan turns up, and he had just been playing Martin Luther on a television series. He'd put on a, a lot of weight. And he had, had a monk's tonsure. He had been shaven to be a monk. So... My wife, Maggie, had some wigs from Python days. She had done the makeup on Python. And, and we had a blonde one that Eric Idle had used before. So I stuck that on Jonathan to make him look younger and cooler. And he did it. Uh, we taped him. And he was breathtaking. He was just everything I wanted. Bow! And that was my first fight with my producer. <laughs> he said, he's not going to be in the movie. I said, he's going to be in the movie. <laughs> and I want that one. So, and yeah, I can't imagine anybody doing what Jonathan achieves. Was the sequence that you did the screen test, was it the where the one where he wakes up, the breakfast sequence? Uh... No, I don't think so. I think it was it was uh, one with, uh, with the girl, with the... Um, the main, the main girl, I think, and I had him acting. Oh, Kelly McGillis was over. She had come over. She wasn't the one that he was playing opposite, and I can't remember the girl because she kind of vanished. But no, it was it was. I just wanted to see the relationship with him and his dream girl and how that was working. Got uh, it. And um, but he was he was spectacular because he's not your proper leading. <laughs> Right. Is what Jonathan isn't. And I didn't want a leading man. I wanted an every man in there, a man who just blends into the crowd. And and that's what he can do. And he can then take charge when he needs to take charge. He's, he's vulnerable when he needs to be vulnerable. And he's incredibly funny. <laughs> that's yeah, the reason I brought up the breakfast sequence is because there's so much physical comedy in that. And he has this sort of uh, Rube Goldberg setup for uh, how he wakes up every morning that Im immediately reminded me of the beginning of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Same thing. Everything is 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 uh, is rigged up to br make his breakfast for him. But of course, it malfunctions and the toast falls in his coffee and he's like flopping his toast back and forth. It's such a magnificent sequence and predates uh, Big Adventure. Now, the electrics here are up the spout. Oh, yours too? Oh, well, um, I'll be there as soon as I can. Yes, thanks. Bye. A lot of that was Jonathan. I mean, I had the mechanical things there. It's what he did with them, the way he could manipulate the bread, the floppy bread. All of that was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, Such an exciting way to introduce his character. Um, and then the, your, your cinematographer went on to do Burton's Batman, didn't he? And the film looks so much like the films of Tim Burton that I, I think, wow, you really uh, kind of must have been a huge influence on Tim Burton. I think it was Roger Pratt, who's wonderful, and, and Brazil is really the first big film he ha he did, uh, and uh, 
And what we were doing, I kept saying, just keep your eye on, you know, German expressionism is what really was what was going on in my head. I wanted those angles, the strangeness. I didn't want things to be um, normal. They're all slightly hyper normal because I don't, I don't know how to do um, reality or naturalism. <laughs> I only know I'm a cartoonist, remember? <laughs> right. And, and cartoonists are uh, grotesque. We make things grotesque. We distort things. We twist things. And you pull them apart as much as you can, as long as they're still recognizable as what you originally wanted. That's it. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I, when you say German expressionism, I'm thinking like Fritz Lang, uh, the, that that era, you know, Metropolis, right? So you have these huge, towering structures, these skyscrapers that look like they go up for miles. Uh, these amazing angles, but then you also have all these uh, film noir references, the fedoras, the long shadows, um, uh, uh, just uh, such beautiful, beautiful imagery in this film. Uh, you can't take your eyes off of it and. And it blows your mind. It's one sequence after another after another. It must have been exhausting <laughs> just to put it all together. <laughs> it was. In fact, we shot for nine months. Wow. Nine months, because I did the special effects stuff as well, shot that. It wasn't like second units doing things. I was there for every moment in that film. And it was utterly exhausting. And... Uh, and not even sure what we were achieving, except it was all interesting what we were achieving, whether it was going to be good or not was something else. Can we talk a bit about the um, the sort of retrofuturism, which I don't even think existed as a word until Brazil came out. <laughs> but you have computers that look are made out of typewriters, 50s TV screens, magnifying glasses, and yet it still feels like you're sometime in the future, not in the past. Well, I think at the beginning of the film, I think I, I, I haven't watched the film for a long time. You, you've seen it more recently than I have possibly. But it's, it's, it takes where, place everywhere in the 20th century is what I put at the beginning of the thing. It's somewhere in the 20th century. To me, it was everything. Past, future, and present. All mixed together was really what I was thinking about. Because there's a lot of 30s stuff I like. But and things were, were developing, like the, the machinery in in... Johnson's office. Um, I, I uh, the, George Gibbs, the special effects guy, he had um, an old teletype machine, and and it had a beautiful sort of 1930s carapace cover. And I said, get that cover off. Let's see what's underneath. And then there's all the gubbins. And I said, all right, now I want uh, the smallest TV screen we can find. <laughs> 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 we stuck that in there, and they said, now we can't see it, so let's put this big magnifying glass in front of it so we can now see. And so the things were built in this rather organic way as opposed to sitting down and designing something. And that intrigued me because I always find when I see things all designed by one person, it all is too harmonious. The world is not like that. The world is messy. And and things from the past we're still using right now, you know, like a on bronze dustpans and things like that. And they're mixed side by side with my, my Mac computer. And we we live like that. We accept it. And that's really what I wanted to do in Brazil. And then I became obsessed by all the things we need. And that's why central services became so important. I started putting all these ducts in because I wanted stuff is brought into us so we don't have to go out. It's delivered to us via ducts. It's also all the trash and shit is taken out by the ducts. So I thought ducts became central for me. And, and, and Norman Garwood so brought in some ducks one day. They're this size. I said, Norma, what are you talking about? I want ducks this side. I want gigantic things. I want, I, I wanted, and it actually, and that was, was a result of living in England because you would see these beautiful Regency houses, beautiful things with, you know, fine details on the outside, little cornices, this, and they then had all this piping crashing right through this beautiful plaster work to get the sewage out and the, and the water in. And, and I thought, oh, people, and that's what we started doing. So we would find these locations. It's like when um, 
Jonathan goes to the party where Mike Palin and his wife is, and he meets um, his mother and Mr. Helpman. That's in the Liberal Club. It's this beautiful 19th century room that is just immaculate detail. And I just then, okay, now let's put some ducks in here and ruin it. <laughs> it, was, it was, I, was, I, would, I would try to find the most beautiful thing and then trying to mess it up with right. the name that people had the needs to make their lives easy at the expense of all the beauty in the world. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the scene in his office where he uh, they use the pneumatic tubes and those ducks to get information to him and starts to overflow and he explodes the whole thing. In my head, I mean, the internet did not really exist back then, but, you know, when you, when you, you there's that expression, that, you know, the internet is a series of tubes. I feel like you were somehow reaching out towards the idea of that, of, of uh, us being connected somehow in a way that's ultimately quite destructive um, if used improperly. Those pneumatic, I, I, I like the, I like your version of it. <laughs> As a kid in Minnesota, I remember going into department stores, and those pneumatic tubes were the way you paid for things. You zing, zip off there, then zip the research would come back. I was fascinated by that kind of, you know, old form, that old mechanics. But it's the same system, except the internet does it not in brass tubing going around the building. It's, we, we just use waveforms floating through the air, which are probably having a, a more deleterious effect on us. All the radio, all the TV, all the Wi-Fi, all of those waves have got to be affecting the way this thing inside our nice skull is 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 dealing with all this stuff. So and anyway. I, can't, I can't help but think of the sequence with Robert De Niro, who plays the uh, the the sort of uh, and the terrorist who's they're all after T Tuttle. Um, and he he uh, he switches to two of the ducks so that the air conditioning becomes the sewage, and then he basically kills poor Bob Hoskins in his uh, big plastic suit. Uh, it, it just seems like a like a good uh, a metaphor for um, for something. <laughs> I'm not sure what, <laughs> but it's, it's an amazing sequence. Puddle's crime is that he's good at his job. At his job is what his crime is, and that's he's there. I can fix all this stuff that the guys who are being paid to fix it are very bad at fixing anything, and he's the guy that fixes it, makes everybody else look bad, which is to me a kind of a terrorist way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you get uh, De Niro to to say yes to this film? Because of course he was De Niro at the time, and uh, it's a small part. What was the process there of casting him? That was the process was called Arnon Milshon, my producer, because he had just produced uh, Once Upon a Time in America. Okay. So the only film with De Niro. And, and Arnon and Bobby had become good friends, and, and it turns out that De Niro was a Python fan. And so he was trapped <laughs> before he knew that we got him. <laughs> and I have to give him, I mean, he, he was extraordinary. He really was. And he added a, a gravitas to things that in some ways didn't, because what he's doing is such silly stuff, but he does it with such gravitas. You believe this guy's the real thing. <laughs> Harry Tuttle, heating engineer at your service. Are you from Central Services? <laughs> I call Central Services. Well, they're a little overworked these days. Luckily, I intercepted your call. What was that business with the gun? Just a precaution, sir. Just a precaution. I've had traps set for me before now. And there are plenty of people in central services who'd love to get their hands on Harry Tuttle. <laughs> are you telling me that this is illegal? 
Well, yes and no. Officially, only central service operators are supposed to touch the stuff. Would you hold this, please? I, but nowadays, with all the new rules and regulations, they can't get decent staff anymore. So they tend to turn a blind eye, as long as I'm careful. Like, mind you, if ever they could prove that I've been working on their equipment. <laughs> well, now, that's a pipe of a different color. <laughs> but wouldn't it be simpler just to, you Could know, you work for... for me, please? Sorry, yes. Yeah. I was saying, wouldn't it be simpler to work for central services? Ah! Uh, couldn't stand the pay. It's getting warm. You couldn't what? Couldn't stand the what? Paperwork. We couldn't stand the paperwork. Listen. This whole system of yours could be on fire, and I couldn't even turn on a kitchen tap without filling out a 27 B stroke six. Bloody paperwork. <laughs> I suppose one has to expect a certain amount. Why? I came into this game for the action, the excitement. Go anywhere, travel light, get in, get out, wherever there's trouble, a man alone. Now they got the whole country sectioned off. You can't make a move without a form. And I have to ask, he's always sort of uh, hooking himself up to some kind of wire system and like d <laughs> diving off the side of a building and it looks like he's like f falling thousands of feet. Is that all uh, visual trickery or how do you achieve those, those escapes? Because they're fluid. They look totally real. It's, there's a little maquette, a little figure that big. <laughs> and, and what was, the, 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 we had models of buildings, but, but what was going on on the ground, what you, you, you perceive as traffic, is just things pulled along there, just on, on pieces of, 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 of cardboard, basically. It is so primitive, and yet we pull it off. It's, you do, absolutely. I love real things as opposed to CG work because there's gravity at work. There's texture. There's all sorts of things that we, I think, um, subconsciously um, appreciate. I think we've seen so much CGI work now that when it began, like with J Jurassic Park, it was totally convincing. But now we know that's not real. Mm -hmm. It looks lovely, and the story is rocketing, rocketing on, but Johnny Depp on a yard arm sword fighting somebody in the middle of a rocky ocean. No, you fall to your death. You don't stand on a yard arm and do all that nonsense. So it's, I, I've always felt that if, and I do use CGI work, but I try to make sure that all the rules of the real world are still um, vital that uh, I don't like cheating uh, on it goes. <laughs> Speaking of more practical effects, the flying uh, in the in the fantasy sequences. So Jonathan Price's character has these extended fantasy sequences where he's um, in a suit of armor, gl glistening golden suit of armor with a giant wingspan and he's flying through the clouds and it looks so good. It, it looks so real and uh, knowing that you had no, no computers to do that is so amazing to me. Um, I mean, I have to assume that that couldn't have been easy. No, it wasn't. That we we had a little figure, an animated figure, the size of like you know an action man is about all he is with the wings, and it it could flap its wings. That's all it had to do. It doesn't head doesn't move, legs don't move, wings flap. That's all. It's, it's then on wires that go up to the motor, the battery, the whole thing that's powering it. And that's on a wire on a track that flew across the top of the stage. And the clouds we have were basically made out of kapok, which is sort of this cottony material people use uh, stuffing inside of um, sofas and, and chairs. It's the stuffing in chairs. <laughs> now, we built cloud shapes out of chicken wire, then put kapok over that, then we had um, sort of trays of, of dry ice uh, sitting on the ground, and we pumped steam into the dry ice, and it created clouds. And that's what all of our clouds are. They're just mechanical things. And then the flying man, that was all shot at four times normal speed. So... <laughs> The little model is all set up. I've got the camera down on the ground, and we're pointing up at it, and and it's action. And the little model goes <laughs> across the stage. You, couldn't, you could barely see it. It was so fast. And you tried to keep the camera pointing at it the whole time. And then it was the next day, you'd look at it, and 
it was then slowed down to normal 24 frames as opposed to 96 frames. And it's the most elegant, beautiful thing flying. And that's it. Amazing. And, and I had to shoot, I shot a lot of stuff because we didn't really know what we were getting with each shot. We had to do it. Then look, at the, then I started cutting the, the scenes, the, the, the shots together that made it look like he was flying this way and that way. And, and I had, it was before we had the ways of taking the wires out. So I had to choose only the shots that you couldn't see the wires in. <laughs> and that is dictated to what you see on screen. It's, I mean, I'd storyboarded the whole thing, but it's still the process of actually making it uh, work was something else. And it, it became about, not about necessarily what, you had to do a lot of just random stuff to then finally get what was what was used. Um, it's it. I don't know. I we spent not a lot of time doing this. Here's the wonderful thing about when we shot this all these effects. It was done in an abandoned warehouse that had been formerly used as the Queen's, the Royal Stationery Storerooms. So it was a building that was designed to keep paperwork in <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> kind of the plot of the film <laughs> um that's incredible so i guess we should shout out george gibbs who was the uh, special effects coordinator uh and so he had come right off of doing a uh, temple of doom the, the the indiana jones film and uh what a ingenious guy he must be really to, to come up with uh, some of these George is very clever, and I have to credit somebody else as well, because Richard Conway is the guy who actually made things like the landscape that the great black monoliths come rushing up through the ground and out. That's just all physical stuff, and Richard did all of that. So it was between the, both of them that were adding different elements that made it work, but it was, it was all... Very simple. I think when the the, the, the big um, monoliths come roaring up out of the ground, it's still some of the most beautiful stuff to me because, again, it's what nature is doing. Because we built the landscape, then we put you know, it was dirt and everything, and then we ram these things up, and the, it's just the way the dust and the dirt uh, spins, and it's totally. Every time I watch it, it's like wow, because you're kind of falling and rising at the same time. It works on your gut more than anything else. And I think that's why I like doing maquettes and, and physical things, because those surprises occur. Now, we haven't spoken about Catherine Helmond yet, but I think if there's like a single image, and it was the one, sure enough, that was uh, thumbnailed when I went to watch to stream the film, and it's the one of Catherine Hellman's character's his cheeks being pulled apart. I mean, that is just seared, I think, into everyone's brains. Uh, so tell us a bit about her plot, which is uh, this progressive plastic surgery journey to, to de-age herself, and, um, and how, you, how she ended up getting the part. Well, let's go from the part first, because I, uh, soap, I thought she was brilliant in soap. And I really wanted her. The studio and Arnon didn't because she wasn't a film star. Ruth Gordon was the one that was I was under pressure to use. And I loved Ruth Gordon, so it wasn't really that big a problem. But when Ruth Gordon, I think she got injured on one of the... Uh, the Cannonball Run, one of those, one of the movies she was doing you know, with, with Burt Reynolds, I think. And so she was out. And we got Catherine. And Catherine, it's, the world was different then because now if you're famous on television, you move into movies and everybody's happy with that. The studios are happy with that. Not then, because Catherine was a big star on television, but in the world of cinema, she didn't count. Not, Nothing, zero. And so I had a big fight, basically, to to say, she gets the part, come on. She's wonderful. She's wonderfully funny. And, and she's sexy. She's got it all. And and so she did. And I was, it was, you know, the idea of a mother who is all about ambition for her son was what she's playing. And she is well-connected. She's a privileged lady. Uh, uh, whoever the father was, was very powerful in the organization. And, and so 
her son, Sam, is disappointing to her. He's not rising. He's choosing not to because he's choosing to avoid responsibility. And and she's... <laughs> Every time I went out to Hollywood in those days, there would be the Los Angeles magazine in the hotel. And the back of the magazine, magazine was full of so many ads for plastic surgery. I'd be obsessed by, and California is the place where eternal youth is the center of life. And it became more and more, I couldn't escape it, so I thought that's what we have to do. it. And ultimately, she transforms herself at least in his de Sam's deranged imagination into his dream girl so we got uh, we got a bit of Oedipus complex backing up my ideas and, for sure and and she was wonderful and again Maggie my wife did the makeup and and works and Jim Broadbent, who's playing the, the plastic surgeon is very clever because he's basically as he's what appears to be pulling, he's actually revealing what's there. And he does it so convincingly, you think he's pulling her flesh out. It's already built out that way. Just try and relax, Mrs. Lowry. Hmm? I'll make you 20 years younger. Ah! Oh, oh, Dr. Jaffe, you are a genius. Would you like to be Surgeon General? I know simply everybody. Well, they won't know you when I've finished with you. Hmm. First. We remove the excess derma. So. Now the flaccid tissues under the eyes. And the forehead. See? <laughs> now, I lift the wrinkles and the worry lines right up into the wig, into the hairline. <laughs> now the template. <laughs> Yeah, now a bit of sticky. And already she's twice as beautiful as she was before. Voila. So the makeup was was designed to already be pre-stretched. Yeah. And he's sort of miming the stretching. And it works. It works really well. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> so the idea for the plastic surgery came from just sitting in a in a in a waiting room in Hollywood and looking at the back of of a Los Angeles magazine. And then, well, it gets even sillier because uh, her good friend uh, is ends up you know, being destroyed by a plastic surgeon because she decided to go to the man as opposed to the, the sort of physical surgeon and that was a result of my father who had some cancer in his ear here and he went to this plastic surgeon the plastic surgeon cut a huge amount of his ear away and then put uh, a bandage on it and said go and sit out in the park and let the acid do its work he didn't sorry he didn't cut it away he put acid on and let my dad was sitting outside, like, in those days, my parents just believed doctors and trusted them to do the... So he's sitting there with this big compress on his ear while the acid painfully is working on him. And he goes back in, and a great chunk of his ear is gone and had to be rebuilt. So I had it in for all plastic surgeons, especially ones who used acid. So that comes up later. <laughs> And it's this the world we live in, and we're still living in this world. It hasn't changed. It's I think it's got even more so because I think people are more more cautious about everything. They don't say what they think. They um uh, uh, I don't know. I, I just I find the world that's why I think the world has become what we uh, thought we were making a satire about. Very much so. But what a what an amazing sequence. And then I, I had forgotten how it gets more and more nightmare. So her friend keeps looking worse and worse every time he sees her until finally her her funeral and then that that uh, her her yeah. casket opens up and she's she looks like a the inside of a peanut butter jelly sandwich. It's really disgusting, but um also uh, quite uh, effective. <laughs> I know. <laughs> was... and she's a, I just I loved her optimism. Yes. This is terrain. Unflappable. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah wow um so now speaking of this ending um because that's towards the end of the film and the film really goes on a, 
a very dark tangent. And um, and then finally, at the very end, you think it's a happy ending, and then and then you're revealed that it's in fact not. Um, and I know that you had a fight with uh, with the studio over over this ending. Is that right? Oh yes. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about about that. First of all, why did you want it to end on this bleak uh, ending? I just wanted to be honest. I think that's what the world was. In a world, you can't just dance off into... That's, I don't really like fantasy. I like, you know, that I don't do fantasy. It's because it's fantasy is just escapist. And, and yes, his dreams are escapist dreams, but the reality of the world is there and he's a little cog in the system and the system is powerful and it'll get you and and yet i thought i always felt to me the ending was a happy ending he, he's ended up in his imagination and and live happily like that he's but you know physically he's incarcerated but mentally he's free so it's not about fantasy, it's about imagination, I suppose, the power of it. And, I mean, I think, what? Are, how do you survive if you're in solitary confinement in a, in a cell? You have to have something like an imagination to create another world that makes your, your survival possible. I don't know how else you do it, except through imagination. And I've always been a big seller of imagination. <laughs> I don't see how life is possible with <laughs> so and so the studio looked at that and said the studio did not like the movie at all i mean i remember at this screening of the film for the studio all the executives i went up into the uh, projection room while it was going on to see how it was going especially at, at, at the end of the film and all i saw, saw were these knotted backs of necks Oh they my were, God! <laughs> not it. And of course, they all come out and they are glad handing me and saying, oh, "Wow, what a wonderful film!" And, and, but their eyes, I could see behind their eyes what they were really thinking. <laughs> and and they I mean, it's basically, yeah. I have to put it down to one man, Sid Scheinberg, who was the head of the studio, and he was in a very bizarre position because his wife, who plays Roy Schotter's Scheider's wife in Jaws. Um, she is the, the wife of Sid Scheinberg, the head of Universal. She loved the movie, I was told. He hated it. He didn't know what to make of it. So he was in a very uncomfortable position. And they said, you've got to change it. And I said, wait, we agreed on this script. I just did the script. We, the studios, had agreed to finance. And I said, you don't get all these talented people together and then say at the end of that, oh, well, we meant another film. We didn't mean the one that you did. And that's, I said, that's cheating. And so I said, I'm not going to change anything. It is what it is. And then they embargoed the film. They wouldn't let us show it anywhere. Uh, we couldn't even get a PR company to go and help us. And and <laughs> Arnon Nelson, the producer, was out of a fair amount of money because he hadn't got the money that he had already spent. Um, and I said, well, we're just going to fight that. We can't fight them with lawyers. Let's go about it a different way. And and I I took an ad out in Variety, which is, you know, normally it's just covered with dollar signs and, <laughs> and zeros, millions and millions being, and I just framed it in black like they do in Europe for funeral announcements. <laughs> and left a lot of white on the page. Most of it's white, except in the middle, in nice typewriter. Very nice. Dear Sid Scheinberg, when are you going to release my film Brazil? Signed, Terry Gilliam. Nothing aggressive, just a simple question. <laughs> and that's when the shit hit the fan. And it was showtime at that point. And they literally were doing everything to stop. And I, I just said, this is... It's not fun. It's it's very painful because you know after all that work, the fact the film might not be released. But I I, I was not going to let that slow me down. I said, I said to the newspapers at one point, I said, any honest uh, decent journalist, we will 
pay bus, bus fare for them to, to go down to Tijuana and watch the film <laughs> <laughs> South of the Border. <laughs> the film had been released in France and Europe already, and it, it received really good uh, re, uh, results, basically. But America, they weren't going to do it. And this fight went on and on. Luckily, I had the <laughs> the good luck of meeting a guy named Jack Matthews, who is a reporter um, for the L.A. Times in the, for the arts section. And he saw the film, and he really liked it. And he started making noise about it. And what he basically did was maintained uh, a conversation between me and Sid Scheinberg. Sid and I, after our first meeting, never spoke again. But he would say, Terry, Sid, he would say, Terry just said this. What do you have to say? And Sid would say, and then he would come to me and say, Terry, Sid just said that. What do you, how do you <laughs> respond to that? And he maintained this dialogue <laughs> in Los Angeles Times wow. between the two of us, which is very good. And then, then I went on, I was invited. No, actually, no, let's be precise. Good Morning America. Maria Shriver was running uh, that show, Good Morning America, and they had wanted to interview um, De Niro for a very long time, and Bobby never did any publicity for his films. He just wouldn't do it. And that's why he's a hero to me. He said, okay, they want to talk to me. We'll go on the show, you and me. So De Niro and I are on the show, and and... Maria Schreier was asking Bobby this idea. They thinking he's just, yes, no, not really. This wasn't much of an interview for him. And then she turns to me and said, Terry, I understand you're having a problem with the studio. And I say, no, I'm not having a problem with the studio. I'm having a problem with one man. His name is Sid Scheinberg, and he looks like this. And I pulled out an 8 by 10 glossy and I ran love up it. the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and shared Sid with the world out there. <laughs> so this this was me just having fun and being outrageous and getting more and more, I suppose, publicity. And then the LA critics discovered, because a few of them had seen it, they'd started underground screenings of of Brazil in private homes in, 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 in Hollywood, Beverly Hills. And they discovered in their bylaws a film didn't actually have to be released to qualify for their awards. And so finally, we're in, I'm not in New York, I'm in, in London, but in New York, there's the great opening of uh, Out of Africa, Universal's big picture of the year. Redford, Beryl Strape, all in New York, everybody's there in their black in their tuxes and what is <laughs> comes across i don't know how it was actually sent to them whether it was on a phone whether it was a fax machine or what but there the la critics voted best picture brazil best screenplay brazil best director gilliam <laughs> wow how huh. what does sid scheinberg say to that I think I think he had very little to say at that point. He was stunned. And, and and then, and I don't think it was said, they decided to release the film because we were getting all this publicity. And <laughs> right. they released it across America, and most of America had no idea why anybody would want to see a documentary about a South American Brazil. country called <laughs> She did huge business on the East Coast, like New York, Boston, the big cities, Chicago, I think it did well. They didn't even have posters at that point. They had fax rushes, um, just rush jobs of some artwork that had been considered possibly for a poster. And, and what it did over the Christmas holidays, per seat, it did more business than any other film in these uh, selected locations. And then they released it wide. And so you go out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and nobody wants to see it. They know nothing about the film. So it made no money. It was, but critically, critically, we did rather well. <laughs> yes. And, and of course, it's a good reminder that, you know, 
it's it's on every list of one of the best sci-fi fantasy films of all time and and the, what the opening weekend box office is ultimately kind of meaningless you know if if it's if it has the goods and it does um your story brought up two things for me one these these private screenings in Beverly Hills uh, reminds me of what happened this year with this film to Leslie which was a micro budget film that um had some uh you know stars that were very impressed with the lead actress's uh, performance and had those kinds of screenings and then she went on to get um an Oscar nomination, Andrew Riseborough, and that there are these uh, sort of grassroots things that happen and, and miracles do happen. Although that was a micro budget film, not a universal picture that was being kept in a closet. But in the end, of course, Sid got his version of the film out as well, though. Ultimately, they went and cut the film. I mean, we got the film released as we wanted to, so it exists as we wanted to. And he was convinced it could be made into a commercially successful film. And and he said the actual theme of the movie is love conquers all. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? That's what the film's about. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, an editor got it in there and chopped it around, chopped most of the fantasy stuff out. I've never actually watched it. I watched a bit of it and I said, well, it's still an interesting film, but it's not the film we made. And and that went out on commercial TV. I mean, how amazing. So he put out this version on TV that was chopped up. I mean, that has to hurt, no? Did, did, you, did you, after from that point on, have a final cut put into your contract or...? No, I did have a final cut period on the film. So that's the side point. The film went out as we wanted it to go out. The fact that somebody wants to fiddle with it afterwards, I'm not particularly worried about it. It's available for all to see. I think Criterion Collection have been very good because they've put Brazil out as made. They've also put Sid's version on the same the same. No day. kidding. So you can uh, mind up who was right and who was wrong. And then it was nominated for two Oscars, right? Apparently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not go that night? Nope. Couldn't be bothered. I mean, I was, Tom and I were nominated for a script. And what was, I can't even what, remember what the other one was for. The Oscars mean very little. Why is that? Well, look, look who wins. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, I, I've thought the ones that didn't win were the better films often. Right. So I don't understand what the judgment of the the Academy Academy members is. It seems to be all over the place. I mean, I know what I think is a good film, and I know what I don't think is a good film as it goes on. I mean, it's like, here's my one, Baron Munchausen. Okay. That's a rather beautiful film. The makeup is very, very complicated, and it's beautiful. You know, he when he ages, he gets young. He goes there. There's so much very careful work. Also, the costumes are extraordinary. Who won that year? Well, for makeup, uh, Driving Miss Daisy. They made uh, um, <laughs> Jessica Tandy. <laughs> Jessica is a. Je- yeah. Made her look old. <laughs> Morgan Freeman looked dark. It's, and, <laughs> right. and of course, at costumes, uh, it was Henry V. And those costumes came straight off the racks down at Angels. I mean, they weren't designed, they were just pulled in. And the costumes on Munchausen are very elaborate, beautiful things. It's like, so. Once, once I've been through a situation like I don't care about those kinds of awards. I, I mean, I, I think what I like is things. I want to make movies that will stick with people or leave shards, <laughs> like like an explosion that's going off in their head and there's shards still in there. And that to me is what's important. The the, the awards don't make to me, much difference. I've watched, I think when Mercedes Rule won Best um, Actress for Fisher King, I wrote her a note saying, your career is over. <laughs> your career is over now. Because what happens, I've known this in the case of too many good actors. They make that big leap, then their agents start asking a fortune for them, and, and they pretty much fade away. 
Uh, and I said, yeah, it's just not, it's not good for you. And I, I, I remember when Fisher King came out and we were in the last group of possible films that would be up for it. It was very close. And I remember walking around outside the house at night just in a state because I said, I don't want to be nominated. I do not want to be no I don't want to go through that nightmare of sitting there pretending to, to have a good time. Well, you're losing. <laughs> wow. It never interests me. So it's, I, I'm only happy about the awards when ones I really admire win. And I think, oh, there's hope for the awards again. <laughs> and there is, that hasn't happened lately. <laughs> not at all, folks. <laughs> I don't want to make you say anything bad of a film, but I do think that this year's Best Picture winner, at least, uh, it was a tip of the hat to your kind of filmmaking in that it was, uh, you know, this surrealist fantasy craziness. See, I think it, to me, it's very impressive as just sheer energy of just energy. And that seems to be, I'm not sure what it's about. I don't <laughs> right. know really about and i didn't i don't understand why what is happening at each moment in it but it's clever it's very brilliantly assembled into this whirlwind of energy and, and people maybe just want that they don't want to have to think about what things really mean anymore right. just keep just keep moving folks it'll all work out somehow <laughs> very interesting to hear your your insight on that so now um i, I have to ask you know you're obviously one of my favorites. What are you interested in doing next? And, and where is your mind? And, and where are you at? We, we want to know. Well, there you go. Uh, I've written, written a new script called The Carnival at the End of Days. So okay. I'm already intrigued. My fatalistic. <laughs> <attitude>. <laughs> I just thought the world seems to me to be so totally fucked up, especially at the level of politics and leadership and 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 community let's say society it's all over the place and and i thought it's time for god to get angry <laughs> wow and i thought, and what do you want humanity rampaging around this beautiful garden fucking it up when <laughs> maybe you have to do something about humanity anyway god decides to wipe out humanity in my foot movie <laughs> that's wow. gonna happen Ending. It's got a happy ending. That's the good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is it about true love? <laughs> Would Sid love it? We'll see if it gets made. But anyway, uh, it's, it's again trying to do satire at the moment seems to be very difficult. People are, you know, there's a new kind of sensitivity, whatever that means, out there. It's not the world at large. It's a very small number of very vocal people who seem to get a lot of other people worried about what they say or what they think. And, and so I, I find satire is, is, is very difficult because if, and my attitude is if you can't laugh at the world and yourself, most of all, you're really in a bad state. Absurdism is what I'm all for because <laughs> it's just looking at what's out there. And, and we are living in a very absurd time, I think. Well, I pray that it all happens. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave with one more question. You know, you're, one of the great Hollywood myths is your, your determination, your journey to make um, the Don Quixote film. And uh, now that it's done and in the rear view mirror, I, it, what is your feeling about having accomplished, uh, you know, this uh, Moby Dick type endeavor? It's, I'm delighted. I, I think we made a really good film. I love the fact that last year during the awards ceremony, our two leading men, and Adam Driver and Jonathan Price, were both nominated for Best Actor. Wow. Of course, it wasn't for Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm delighted. I think the film, I'm really happy with it. It got the worst distribution of any film I've ever been involved with. Complete disaster. So the number of people that have seen it are pretty small. It also got the kind of reviews you know you're going to get when you spent 30 years or 25 years, whatever it was, to make it. Because the reviews, even even the good ones, start very nice. They go through, and then the last paragraph is, "But was it worth thirty years?" 
Right. And the answer is always going to be no. It's always going to be no. So that's those are the reviews I predicted, and they dutifully turned up just as I had hoped. <laughs> Well, Terry, I, I just think it's so inspiring that you saw it through and uh, you're such a hero to me. And I know to so many of our listeners, uh, you're so inspiring to me. So thank you. It's just so touching that I got to ask you all these questions and to meet you face to face. Thank you so much. No, it's been fun. It's, actually, it's, it's funny about talking about the past because I always find when we're actually in the film, making Brazil, I remember when we first started showing it. I thought it was a complete disaster. Half the audience would walk out. They walked out. You go, go into a big screening, and then the lights come up at the end. <laughs> Half the seats are empty. They just didn't know how to react to it. I think the best thing that came out of, in particular, a Time magazine review of, of Brazil, which is fantastic review, uh, and... And I had that magazine with me when I went to um, Japan to promote the film. And going through uh, immigration, I didn't have a visa because I didn't know that living in Britain, you had to have a visa to get into Japan. And so I'm taken by the immigration officials into the back room, <laughs> locked in the back room. And they're very rude. They're very... Uh, aggressive, I'd say, saying, you know, what do you think you're doing here, breaking? And I didn't know what hotel I was staying in. I didn't know the name of the driver that was waiting for me because one had gotten so used to going on promotion tours tours, and you get off the plane and they're all waiting for you. It all happens. And and so I had never paid anything. I had no information of who, what, or where. Uh, and the local distributor was not 20th Century Fox. It was a local version. And and it was looking very bad for me. And then I realized I had the Time magazine with me <laughs> that I'd read re good review. And I pulled out the magazine. I turned to the review page and said, this is who I am. They went into the other room. very and they, and they came back and they were just bowing. <laughs> <laughs> so one review saved me. And that's all it took. I'm happy with that one review. I don't care about the other reviews. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you once again, Terry Gilliam. What a fantastic opportunity that was to spend some time with Terry up in his attic in London and uh, just pick his brain about uh, everything. So thank you, Terry Gilliam. Uh, you are a hero. And next week, we have another really out there fun film. It's called Repo Man. It's from 1984, and it's by someone named Alex Cox, a British filmmaker who uh, went to UCLA and then made this strange kind of mixture of punk ethos with sci-fi, and uh, it's definitely one that I loved as a kid. So we encourage you to watch it. You can see both Repo Man and Brazil uh, on most of your streaming services. Give it a watch and then come back next week and we'll have Alex Cox telling us how that wonderful, strange movie came to be. And until then, we'll see you in Hollywood. Hollywood.